A really warm welcome to everybody joining us on our Echohow webinar series. I'm really excited for this one today because I always learn something new when I get to listen and spend time with Keith. And Keith is taking the time out of his busy schedule to come and talk to us and give us some really great essential Wi-Fi troubleshooting tips. I can't tell you how helpful and useful this is going to be for myself personally moving forward when I need to go and troubleshoot a Wi-Fi network. I know there's going to be so much great information here. So Keith, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Oh, I'm fantastic. Having a great day. Perfect. So uh, today we have got myself, I work for, for Echohow looking after the product marketing and we've got Dale all the way over from the US who does sales engineering. I'm, I'm focusing today on Wi-Fi checklists. I, this has been a project that's taken me well over six, almost seven years to build out. And I was reminded um, after I posted something from Wi-Fi Design Day, actually this slide, this start slide, uh, someone by the name of Donald from Pansift over in Ireland sent me a copy of a request he had of me from six years ago when he said, you know, we should really make a checklist. And I wrote this huge, long essay <laughs> in an email back to him saying why checklists are just stupid for a Wi-Fi. And uh, I'm here apologizing now for that. Sorry, Donald. That was that was my cockiness. And Part of the issue is we think we're really smart. And a lot of us in this industry are, are incredibly smart and we have lots of experience. And, and my initial reaction to him when he said we should have a checklist was, oh, come on, it's too complex, all these things. And so he recommended me a book called Checklist Manifesto. And I'm gonna refer to that in a minute. But this has been a, a seven year journey for me to get to this point where yeah, we, we really need to go with the checklist because it helps everyone along the way. So just first up, there's uh, me. Uh, if you want to follow me, I'm on I'm on the social medias and via email and you can get me off that little list there. And by the way, that's my pre-COVID hair. This is my post-COVID hair when I turned white. Um, to start, before we can start into troubleshooting, I'm going to review some very quickly some resources that I think you should have and use and hold and be very, very comfortable with. There's a lot of generations of 802.11 and it's been coming along for a long time. 25 year anniversary of Wi-Fi is this year. So yeah, we've been doing this for a long time. It's also got faster and faster along the way. It's become more and more complex along the way. We have more MCS rates. You know, we, Originally, we just had one and two meg data rates, and then we went to one, two, five, and 11. And now we have an MCS table that wouldn't fit on a wall. So it's incredibly complex. So first understand that it's there and, and figure out where we are in this list. You also need to understand the frequency bands that we have in Wi-Fi. We have two, four, five gig and six. And there's just some charts I put together but I did them for me and I'm glad others use them as well because you need to see how our use of the 2-4 spectrum has to be shared with other people's use of the 2-4 spectrum along the way. And you'll see certain things when you fire up your sidekick and you're looking in uh, the spectrum analysis and you see these little blips and they happen to be there because the BLE is there on those all the time chattering away. That doesn't mean there's something harming Wi-Fi. They were purposely placed in between Wi-Fi channels, if you use the right 1, 6, and 11, uh, to not cause harm. And so when you see those, just realize where they are. You also need to understand the entire five gig spectrum, all the uni ones, twos, threes, and fours, and how they affect in your specific uh, geo. Not every regulatory domain supports all the same, and some have different, different transmit powers you can use, different channels you can use. Some you can and can't use the, the the TWR, the, the Toppler, the weather. Anyway, you know what it is. I can't even read it without my glasses. We also now have six gig and not everyone has six gig around the world. We haven't harmonized between geos. Uh, hopefully that's coming over the next couple of years, but there is a lot of spectrum, even in, in the EU that have use of six gig. It's even, even a little bit, you don't have it all, you still have as much as we have in five gig. So there's going to be a lot of changes going on here. 
on these charts, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of eye candy, but if you print them out and you can zoom in, there's a lot of information on here from what's the physical wavelength to what's the free space loss calculation for every single channel. There's a lot of details in there. So go ahead and, and, and get them and look at them closely. My favorite, MCS. I, I like MCS for troubleshooting. I use, it's probably my go-to number because it is a self-reported health of the Wi-Fi. It's not what could be possible, it's what is. And the transmitter device, whether it be the access point or the client, self-regulates and depending on the environment that it's in at that moment when it goes to transmit, it chooses an MCS rate based on its capability, the, its receiver's capability, and what they've negotiated in advance, and what the current situation allows. So though you might have great SNR or fantastic RSSI someplace, if the MCS is low, there's a reason. And so things like channel contention could cause MCS to drop, even though we have a higher uh, SNR or a higher RSSI. So I like using MCS because it's, it's a quick way to see a self-regulated number. And if, if you look at this chart and you go, I don't even know how to use it, go study. I mean, th there's places to learn how that works. I developed this, oh, probably five years ago, four years ago for a uh, Akihau troubleshooting class, the first Akihau troubleshooting class. And what I did was I wanted to look and see when people are trying to troubleshoot Wi-Fi, it's not always the RF. Sometimes it's the RF contention and it's kind of the pink light one in the RF medium. Sometimes it's in the process flows. So in this is a little bubble for every step that takes place during network communications. Some of them are red. They're the Wi-Fi RF versions. Some of them are blue. Those are the ones that are on your local network. And some of them are green or are on the WAN. Any one of these bubbles, and I think there's 33 bubbles to choose from, could fail. And if it does fail, the answer is always Wi-Fi sucks. And, and we know it's not always the Wi-Fi fault. So you need to understand how this flow works, what each of the bubbles do, how they have different metrics. And here's a detail of the different metrics for each one of the bubbles. Some of them have five, 10, 15, 20 different metrics to look at. So it, this whole list here that we're looking at was the reason I told Donald six years ago, it's so complex, we can't have a checklist. But I've changed my mind because checklists help. So I just went over those really quick of the resources because you should have them. At the end of this slide deck, I'll have a URL you can go to and you can go download all those resources and more to help you in your own personal learning about how these things work. Those last two, you need to really understand how that whole flow works from bubble to bubble to bubble, all the metrics, and then you can start using the checklist. So I have a story about the checklist and I'm gonna skip it because we have a lot to talk about here in, in this webinar. We wanna get more into the troubleshooting pieces, but you can go on uh, my blog, uh, wmpros.com, and there's a blog about kind of the story of how I found checklists are required. So six years ago, I read this checklist manifesto book. I think you should read it. It's very interesting. It's got some great stories about how other industries that are as complex as ours and also have super, super smart people also needed checklists. So what took us so long? Well, I was talking to my, my children. I have uh, four children and they're all married. So I have two sons and two uh, son-in-laws and one's an F-16 pilot. And when I told him we don't have a checklist because we're so cocky and we think we're smart and we're engineers and we don't like people telling us what to do. And he goes, so you've never met a fighter pilot? My son, who's an RN, works in OR, said, we have to use checklists every day. How do you get away without using checklists? And I said, we have super cocky, very smart engineers who just don't get along. And he goes, have you ever met a surgeon? So other people who are also super smart and very cocky and think they know it all, they use checklists. So why did it take us 25 years to get to this point? Others have done it, and it doesn't matter if it's, I, I, I have a, a sister-in-law whose husband's a truck driver, and I mentioned what I was speaking on today, and she goes, oh yeah, yeah, my husband uses checklists every single time he starts the truck. People use checklists for everything. Why we don't? Just because we haven't done it yet. So, uh, and, and partly it's because it is complex. So the, the first checklist I'm going to talk about is one I've used for 
two decades now, and it sounds kind of silly. How to not have a wireless problem is to not let a wired problem become a wireless problem. That's, it sounds really silly, but it's actually really simple to do. Now I've done this for over 20 years and I do it by having my rollouts with my customers follow a certain plan. And I don't like to climb up on ladders and install access points. There's somebody that's already doing that. It's the guy who's pulling the cable. He's up on the ladder. He's at the location. There is the drop. Everything is there. Why do I have to go up on a whole second pass and put that up? So I have negotiated with the cable pullers folks and I pay them from my budget, not from their cable budget to do the following steps. And it's been fantastic. Now, there's some caveats here. Not everyone rolls out their networks in this way. I'm a Wi-Fi guy. I like to be last. I want to make sure everything works before you put the Wi-Fi on because I spent too much time troubleshooting Wi-Fi. There was never a Wi-Fi problem to begin with. So if you have the network designed and the locations where they're supposed to go, you rack and stack all the switches and routers and everything's ready on the wired network. You let the cable installers do their job. And then at the very last step, before you even plug in the AP, you do this checklist, which is you make sure you don't have a wired problem. If you make sure the wires are all exactly what they want, the right VLANs, the right PoE, every, you can see the default gateway, all the pieces can work on the wired network, then you'll find problems before you hook up an AP. Because what I found, as soon as you attach an AP, everything becomes a wireless problem, even though it wasn't. So do all these things first, and then you install the AP. And then after you install the AP, you're going to have to do some more things. And hopefully, because I'm paying a cable guy to do this, I want him to document the location and the switch port used and the IP address and all, all the normal documentation stuff, as well as is the AP aligned correctly uh, for my K12, and I've done lots of K12. I have them put the light on the AP pointing toward the door because when I go to troubleshoot, I would like to just look through the door and not open and disrupt the people inside. So little things like that, and you just add them to the list. They will plug it in and wait, and usually has to read, depending on the vendor, it might reboot twice. And then it's now got its config and it's publishing its SSIDs. Then I have them just use their client, their phone, whatever they have, and put in the first SSID and make sure that they get connected, that all the things work that are supposed to work. At this stage, I don't, I'm not testing .1x, I'm not testing PSK. I just want the access point to transmit and we want to take everything out that's above Wi-Fi. And we'll see later when we do a connection analysis what the, where that D mark is. But I'd like the Wi-Fi to work. And so if they walk away from an installed AP with the Wi-Fi working and proof that all the wires works, amazing how many wireless problems just disappear because you never let them be a wireless problem. Okay, the bane, that was just a teaser for checklist. The bane of us as wireless engineers, yeah, it's all the old, it depends. Sam Clements has, you know, I think he trademarked it. So Sam Clements, TM, it depends. We have it depends everywhere because it does. Everything we do depends. We have tons of rules we try to follow. Don't hang an AP on the wall like a clock. Yep, I've put APs on the wall like a clock. If you the situa situation demands it. So there are rules, but then we, we break the rules because they're not always, they're not 100% useful. Because of this, it depends. We've been afraid. I have been afraid. That was my seven-year journey to get here today of putting things documented into a checklist. But once they're in a checklist, they make it easy. We can quickly do it. And one of my first complaints to Donald at the time was, if you put in a checklist, stupid people who don't understand Wi-Fi are going to use the checklist. And I just came to realize, and what's wrong with that? Wouldn't it be nice if everyone followed the checklist and had a better Wi-Fi experience? And even if some super smart Wi-Fi guy didn't get kudos on his back for fixing the problem, it'd be nice if Wi-Fi worked better. So here we go. Wi-Fi checklist. This is targeted at the 80 to 90%. This isn't the corner cases. This isn't in a, in a, in a warehouse with, you know, 50 meter high ceilings where you have to do other different things. This is just normal. 
I have realized, and after talking to scores of other wireless engineers about this list, we all don't agree, and that's okay. So I put some variables, the variables are in green, and you put in your numbers that you think in your environment are your requirements. If you have a justified reason to not follow these recommendations, please follow your own recommendations. I'm not trying to say this is the only way. I just wanted to give us a structure where we could follow a way to go about it. But this is just a starting point. Don't worry about it. Let's get into these. So there's a, a, a short version and the short version just has the top 25 issues. And this is voting from, I don't know, probably 60, 70 different people we voted and kind of came up with uh, the ones that we thought should be in the top. For each of these, there's three bands, two, four, five gig, and six. And for some of the recommendations that we're going to have in a checklist, like the first one, one, six, and 11, well, that's a two, four only requirement. So there's nothing in the five or the six gig columns. Some of these have a positive. There's a checkbox as in, in two, four, we want 20 megahertz channels only. So if you have 20 megahertz channels only, that's a positive check. We also have don't use 40s in 2.4 gig. And so if you do use 40s in 2.4 gig, then you don't get it. So the X means don't put anything kind of thing. This is supposed to be just really simple. Then some of them have green, like a 40 megahertz channel should not be used in 2.4. But in 5 gig, if you aren't getting co-channel interference, co-channel contention, then they're fine to use. So there's nothing wrong with using a 40 in five gig. In fact, it might be the thing you want to do. But as soon as you run into co-channel interference or co-channel contention, even in five gig with 40s, that means don't use 40s because it's better to have two APs on two 20 megahertz channels than two APs on 40 megahertz channels who end up sharing the space together and then they degrade the performance. So this is just a quick view for each of these lines. I made a, to the right side, is a list of what it means, where it came from. So there's the topic, 1.6 gig only, and then there's some notes. And I've shared all these so you can edit the notes and put any kind of notes you want there. If you look at them all together, uh, there's a way to evaluate them. And at the bottom, this is a just a, a simple Excel spreadsheet. You don't need to have any a lot of math skills or brains. If you met the requirement, put in a one. If it didn't requirement, didn't meet the requirement, put in a zero. If you didn't need it, don't even put anything because like you don't use one, six, 11 in five gigs. So there's nothing to put in. And then if you just put in the ones where you meet them and the zeros where you didn't at the bottom, it will show up how close you got. Questions? Anything there, Matt? Um. No, people are saying how much they really like the um, the checklist and the, the ability to be able to um, add the possible suspected symptoms to the relevant checklist item. So uh, people are now saying fantastic and they can't wait to get a copy of the uh, the checklist. How about you, Dale? Yeah, one of the questions that just popped up, it says, what about Wi-Fi 7? But, you know, that would fall under, well, Wi-Fi 7 is going to apply to all three of these frequency bands, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and, and Wi-Fi 7 questions. Uh, might not today be in the top 25 because we, we, they're, they're not that important in enterprise environments, but they will be in the extended list that I'm going to cover in a second. So, uh, yeah, someone go ahead. Has just, someone, has, well, I, someone has just said that, Keith, you are a lifesaver. This is a lifesaver. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope so. So this is, the, obviously, this is, this is not for this presentation. This is a sheet of paper. It fits on a an app by 11 or an A4. A on the front side is the checklist. On the back side are the notes. You print them out and you can just go ahead and check, 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 check. There's an Excel version that you can just use yourself. Well, you can't even read these. They're so small. And without my glasses on, I definitely can't read them. So what I did is I broke them into little chunks of five that we can talk about. So here are the first five. 1611 only. That's a 2.4 issue. In five gig, you don't use it. 20 megahertz. You want 20 megahertz only in 2.4, and you use them in 5 gig, you use them in 6 gig. Uh, for, as we go to 40s and 80s, you have to look at them, and you note under 5 gig, it's not recommended because in most enterprise locations, when you use an 80, you have co-channel interference. <laughs> Just, I've been around the world in, in hundreds of locations, literally in 120 countries, 
And I've yet to find a place where 80 megahertz channels in an enterprise environment work. That's, it says not recommended. But since this is an Excel spreadsheet and you can change it, you could change that back to say, oh yeah, we love 80s. I personally don't love 80s. But when we get to six gig, 80s can be very useful as long as you don't have co-channel interference. The, the rule for the size, the width of your channels is totally down to use the widest channel you can until you can't. How do you know you can't? If you have co-channel interference. How do you know you have co-channel interference? If you have more than two APs on the same channel at the same place, greater than neg 85, you have co-channel interference by definition. And so if I have co-channel interference, two APs, co-channel contention, two APs sharing the space, two APs are sharing the space. That is not what we want. We would rather have two APs on 40 megahertz channels not bumping into each other. We'll get a net higher throughput. And Keith, I do want to ask yeah. a question with that. You know, one of the questions somebody asked is, what about 160 megahertz wide channels with six gigahertz being here? I think kind of what you said around 80 megahertz would kind of apply to this, but what are your thoughts on that? If if I get, when we get down to the extended list, the top 66, not just the top 25, 160s and 320 show up down there. They're not, in, in today's environment, 160s and 320s aren't even a thing in, in most locations. Even in the U.S. where we have 1.2, you know, megahertz worth of space to, to use, 160s, you know, you're still going to end up with co-channel interference, especially because we're on uh, low power indoor. When we go to outdoor, it could even get worse. So let's just table that. It was a good question and nice that you saw it. It is included. It's just not in the top 25. Okay, thank you. So Matt, we have the top five here. If you had to go find these using FAO tools, how would you go about finding the answers to these? Basically, there's 15 questions. Five questions across three bands. How would you find the answers using Echo? Great question. I will um I will steal the share and I will uh, show you uh, how one of the ways that this could be possible. So, um, if you had, are not familiar with one of our latest features. It's uh, something that's called Echohal Optimizer. And what Optimizer will do is it will actually, once you have completed a survey of your environment and you sync it to our cloud, you can have your survey data reviewed by Optimizer. And this will be reviewing your specific network against your specific requirements and then give you some specific recommendations. So um, those five uh, checks that Keith had are pretty much around the channels and the uh, the data rates. So Optimizer is checking at the moment against roughly around 10 different criterias. And what it does is it presents it back to you in a... Um, kind of like a traffic light system. So if you see that you one of your criteria has got a green traffic light signal next to it, it means it's that's all good, passing against requirements and you've got no issues here. However, if you see something that is amber or red, that means that we've got some problems and we want to try and, and try and fix them if we can. So one of the things that Keith was mentioning with his checklist was around um, checking for channel interference. So what I can do is I can click on this card here it takes me to the visualization, and this is what we're looking at here for the uh, Echohal Helsinki office. And then it breaks down the three different frequency bands on the left-hand side. So 2.4, 5, and then 6 gigahertz. And what we can see here is that we're currently failing against our requirements on 6 gigahertz in quite a big percentage of that. And what we do is we give you on the right hand side some best practices recommendations for uh, following when it comes to channel interference. And I'll show you in a second, but we actually give you detailed recommendations for how to reconfigure your network for your specific access points, specific channels, and how to approach that. And if you follow those recommendations, you can visualize the impact on your network if you are to implement those changes. So you can see we're not making any physical changes to the access points, locations, or anything like that. Just by making some adjustments to the channel whips or the channels that are currently in use, you can go from having a poor performing Wi-Fi network to having no co-channel interference. So how do you see what those recommendations are? And hopefully let's see if they're in line with Keith's checklist. You can see here we've got our access point configuration changes. If I click on view all changes, on the left hand side it breaks down all of the access points and then the three radios inside of the access points, one for 2.4, 5 and 6 gigahertz. We see the bands here and we see that the current channel width, so on 2.4 gigahertz at the moment it's on 20 megahertz wide and that's good. So that's 
passing against Keith's checklist as well. So there's no recommendation here, but look on five gigahertz. At the moment, it's currently on 80 megahertz wide, but it's recommending going down to a 20 megahertz wide channel. So a bit like what Keith was saying in his checklist, if you have very wide channels and you have co-channel interference, then you should move down to a narrower channel width. However, if we didn't have any channel interference, then Optimizer wouldn't be making this recommendation. Same thing here for six gigahertz. And then what you can see on in this column is making the recommendation for what uh, channel to go and change to, to try and avoid as much channel interference as possible. And then you can see um, some other things here around transit power and if we should have the radio on or off, but this is the same uh, recommendations for all of the access points that you have in your environment. You can scroll through and see all of these changes. So that was checking against the channels. The other thing I noted down was on the part of that checklist was around data rates. And actually something that we can check um, with Echohal is if you have configured your Wi-Fi networks in line with best practices and in line with Keith's uh, recommendations. So what we can see here, if, if I think back to Keith's checklist uh, on 2.4 gigahertz, pretty much now we don't want to be uh, enabling anything under 12 meg so that would be supporting 802.11b and we've got we've got those recommendations here as well and it's highlighting currently all of the ssids in the network the different frequency bands and what minimum basic rates are currently enabled and uh, allowed on each different uh, ssid and the frequency band and that's why it's being highlighted as red here and it's making those uh, recommendations to to change to the same thing that was on the checklist so so far, Optimizer and Keith's checklist is doing okay. And this is one way that you can use this to leverage for your networks to ensure that they are going to be passing against the requirements. So I will stop the share and pass back over to you, Keith. And see if I can bring it up on my side. Switch back. Okay. Is that working now for you? Okay. Yep. Let's move on. So we can do the same thing. The next six down are checking is do you have your 8011K on? Do you have R on? Do you have V on? And people are like, well, how come you're not recommending V? Well, I'm not going to stop here and talk about it, but there there are lots of people who discuss this in that we've been discussing online in a lot of ways. Why? Now you see on number seven, the fast transition has that little asterisk, carrot asterisk. That's because we don't have uh, agreement. There's like not a lot of agreement. And, and a lot of this comes down to different vendors and different client devices. So if I'm a, a warehouse and I have some hand scanners that I'm using that just can't deal with fast transition, well, then I'm not going to turn it on. And so this one, it's recommended to have it on most of the time, but some people say, well, in my world, I don't recommend. That's why this is something you can change and edit yourself. Same with, with band steering. A lot of people say, oh, KV and R, they all go together. Sometimes V is trying to push people around to different places and we don't want it if our clients aren't supporting it. So these recommendations on here, I am sure out of the thousands of people who are listening to this, they're going to go, well, I don't believe. Yeah, I, I know not everyone agrees, but this gives us a place to look. Now, the, the two here on firmware consistent and updated, we only had the, the top 25 and I used up two of the slots for this because these are two different questions. Is all your updated, your firmware updated to its current amount? And that's one good question to have, because if it is, if there was ever bugs in the system, hopefully the latest version of code fixes the bugs. And that's one issue. Sometimes it causes it. You got to be careful about that. But the other is consistent firmware across APs. Now, sometimes people buy APs and they're not all the same across the network. And so some APs are nearing end of life and they might not get the next rev of the software. So there's a problem that happens when you have APs on different versions of software. Now the controller might be the same. It might be the most updated software, but if, it, if they're not the same, there's one other issue you're gonna have to look at in troubleshooting. So that's why there's two separate questions here. Uh, AP transmit power on number 11 and the channel consistent bonding. Uh, the channel bonding if you look in 2.4, it's like don't bond channels because we don't have enough space. In 5 gigahertz, it's okay to do channel bonding, but you should be consistent. Now, I stuck in the word high side consistent. So if you're going to have a 
40 megahertz channel, you want to have your primary channel always on the high side or always on the low side. I don't care. The problem is it, when you mix match those, you get a condition called OBSS and it's actually far worse than adjacent channel interference. It's a terrible thing to have happen. And sometimes automatic radio resource management pieces from vendors forget this little piece. And I've seen some very nicely designed networks with OBSS all over because the RRM just did it. And so it, it's a it's a bad thing. And so we need to check to see it's happening. Um, the BSS load element, the asterisks behind this aren't that we shouldn't be looking at it. The asterisks are what is our target? And so you can put in what your target range is. The reason 2.4 has 40% is because you know what? 2.4 is busy, crowded, it's an ugly place. But we would like to keep our load lower in the other things. There are some others who also look at the same element and say, well, if I'm running voice, I want one number. If I'm running video, I want another load element. If I'm running high speed data, I want a different element. So feel free to put in what you need in your environment, but you should be looking at this and tracking it because it's telling us how busy the APs are reporting their own airspace. Adjacent channel interference is separate from co-channel interference because it hurts worse. If I'm on channel one and you're on channel one, we're sharing and we play nice. If I'm on channel one and you're on channel two, we kind of fight over the same thing. And so it is a less efficient way to set something up. So there's a co-channel interference item and there's an adjacent inter interference item because you want to look at those two separately. And sometimes the adjacent channel interference is not caused by you or your own network, but it still exists. You fixed the co-channel interference in yours, but your neighbors are on some weird channel seven or something. Uh, so here's the, the channel interference. How would you set the channel interference um, Matt, in Ekehau, if you wanted to say, I wanted no co-channel interference greater than neg 85. Is that a, a metric that Ekehau deals with? Totally. No, I, and, I set you up because um, I know it is. <laughs> yes, exa exactly that. So I can um, I can actually just show you very quickly if I steal the share back from you, Keith. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is just, I don't know why this does it, but Zoom always likes to relocate my um, speaker window when... Um, uh, I go to I go to share. So uh, if you're not if you've never seen Echo AI Pro before, um, what I'm looking at here is a uh, the, the the software that runs on your laptop. And what we've got what I've got open here is something that's called a, a survey file. So someone's gone and collected the uh, uh, data with a Psychic or a Psychic Two, and that's what we see these green lines and paths for here. And um, the green access points, what we can see is uh, the customer's access points placed on the map. So what Keith was asking is, is it possible for when we are trying to visualize channel interference, can we set what that, that threshold? Uh, and the answer is yes. There's a couple of ways that we can do it. So I'll show you uh, the first way. So if I change the visualization from none, and I take a look at the uh, the channel interference. Uh, what you'll notice is that pretty much everything here is going grey um, in the in the environment. So um, why why is that? Well, that's because we've got the uh, access points all sharing this uh, same channel at a certain different threshold. But how can we how can we set that? If I go to my uh, project and I go to my coverage requirements. Uh, what I'm able to do here inside of my uh, coverage requirements, where it says the um, uh, channel interference, you can see you can set this threshold here for um, what Keith was referring to. So we've got minus 85 and minus 85 here. This network doesn't have six gigahertz access points supported. Um, so that's why we've got nothing configured here. But if I was to change this threshold, um, this would then be reflected down on the, what we're looking at in the uh, heat map but we by rule of thumb we want to keep it to that neg 85 because when you have two access points that can hear each other on the same channel at that threshold that's when you go on into that co-channel interference um and then keith if it's okay i um I was going to, I might come back to this file in Echo AI Pro once you finished your presentation because there's a few things I can show here around some troubleshooting but when you was talking about some of the uh, other metrics that to look for in your checklist, especially around the amendments and the uh, transmit power BSS load, 
uh, and all that kind of stuff. I was going to just show people quickly how they can use one of our tools to see that. And we've had a couple of questions come in uh, specifically around 802.11b and why we would or wouldn't uh, recommend that. So if that's okay, I will just um, show everybody how to do that using another tool. So I'm going to share my uh, iPad screen with you all now. So hopefully... Uh, you can all see this okay. Unfortunately, I can't see everybody now. I can just see my iPad screen, but that's okay. But um, our analyzer application, if you're not familiar with it, it runs on your uh, mobile device, so your iPhone or on your iPad, and uh, or you can have it on your Android phone or Android tablet. And actually, the iOS analyzer application just had an update last week to 2.5, and I've got my Psychic 2 uh, plugged in and connected right now. So um, going back to Keith's checklist, because I made some notes here, uh, first of all, about how can we check to see uh, what amendments are being used by some of the uh, access points in our environment around us? And what I can do is if I click on the bottom here where it says network overview, it's going to give me a list of all of the SSIDs and the access points that I can see uh, around me now. And if I want to, I can configure this layout at the top from this three dots and I can pick the kind of things that I would like to see specifically for on this screen and customize my columns. But what I was going to do is just jump into an example of one of the um, networks that I've got around me. And I'm going to pick this one here that says MNF5. I click on the little eye icon. And um, what I can actually see here on the very far right hand corner, I can see uh, the second from the bottom is the amendments. So we can see that this SSID uh, from this access point is currently got enabled 802.11k and 802.11v. And then the other thing that keeps it about checking is the transmit power. So the power that the access point is currently using is 100 milliwatts. There's a whole bunch of extra information that we can see here, especially things like uh, data rates and um, the uh, country code and a few other things to talk about. Um, but one thing that Keith did mention was the BSS load and the channel utilization. So um, this really does actually come down to depend on if the access point is, is advertising this, but we can actually see this here in the Echohow Analyzer application as well. And there was a couple of questions that came in on the uh, chat asking us, uh, why we would or wouldn't recommend having 802.11v enabled or uh, if why we would disable it on a network. And I thought that I might just tell a quick story about a real troubleshooting case that I had to do for, uh, there was a warehouse that we had designed a brand new Wi-Fi network for. We had gone and we had uh, did the survey of the environment. We did our model, we did our design, we validated it. We got it installed. We got it all working. Everything was all going okay. Um, but after we had finished the, the deployment and configuration, we started to test the scanners. And the type of scanners that were actually in use were um, a type of scanner called the Honeywell CT40 scanners. I don't know if you're familiar with these scanners or if you've ever come across them before, um, but what they were being used for was to go and scan inventory and then um, basically being used to keep track of stock and uh, making sure orders were getting sent out okay. But what, what we found was is that the scanners kept on getting disconnected from the network and we were spending some time trying to fix figure out what was going on and see if we could fix the issue because when we looked at our survey results and our data we could see that everything looked good we had great coverage we had great primary coverage great secondary coverage we had no channel interference everything looked really good from a, an rf perspective um but even when these scanners were right underneath some of the access points they were getting the uh, disconnected and what would actually happen is they would make these beeping noises so as the uh, guys or girls in the warehouse was using the scanner they go and try and scan some imagery and go beep 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 beep, beep. and then they would get this message to say it's been disconnected and we was really trying to figure out what was going on um, so it got to the point where we really decided that we needed to understand how the uh, CT40 scanners what they were actually capable of. So I tried looking online on the data sheets to see what they supported, uh, see if I could figure out what was going on with them. Uh, and, but I couldn't find like a, too much detail online. So what I ultimately needed to do uh, was try and do a wireless packet capture of the uh, Honeywell CT40 scanner going to associate to a Wi-Fi network, because then what I could do if I captured that association frame is I could peek in to see what the device was capable of doing. And one of the really nice and easy ways that you can do that now with the analyzer application and with the Psychic 2 is if I click on packet capture, what I am actually able to do now, if I click on new capture, 
because the Psychic 2 has got four Wi-Fi radios inside of it, you can actually capture on up to four channels at the same time. So I can just pick anything, any four channels across the uh, 2.45 and the uh, 6 gigahertz networks. And I simply hit capture and it's going to initialize the capture. And what it's going to do, it's going to start showing me the duration and the file size of the packet capture. And then what I would hopefully be able to do if I re-enable my Wi-Fi on my phone, maybe it will associate to my nearby access point that I've got. And hopefully it's gone through that process now. And then I hit stop capture. And what I can do is I can share that to my uh, Mac. And then hopefully that will go through. All done. Perfect. And then what I can do now, if I go back and stop my uh, screen mirroring, I get to see the... Uh, uh, everybody back now so and what i can do is i've now got this packet capture and what i can do is i can actually open it it's going to open up wireshark and then what i can do is i can go through the wireshark packet capture look for that association request frame and then i can go in there and see what my device was capable of and going back to what we did for the honeywell ct40 scanners is we found out that the scanners they did not support 802.11b uh, basically, it's referred to as like BSS transition when you go through the, the trace file. And what we did then is we basically disabled 11B on the SSID and all of the problems went away with the scanners. So I know there's a bit of a long-winded way to kind of answer the why do we recommend it or not recommend 802.11B. It really comes down to your specific network, your clients, and your testing because all of the other devices, it was working fine. It was just these specific scanners that were having issues with 11B. So hopefully that covered most of the points for what Keith was saying around his checklist and how you can find them in Analyzer. And I will stop sharing so you can continue your amazing presentation, Keith. Okay, there we go. So those are the, the top 25. And you can look at them. And if you put the little numbers in, the, the results just kind of pop up. First of all, I don't want to say that this is the best ever. These are best practices. It's just based on my experience and a whole bunch of other people I ask, and we don't always agree. But it's a structure that you can use to find those answers. If you personally use V and you don't have a problem, change it on your checklist and run your checklist that way. This is more of a structure we're looking at. So there's also an extended checklist that has more things that weren't in the top 25. Things like ERP protection, you know, if you're not running BG mode, do you even need it or care? Uh, there's country codes, and yeah, that's important that you have the right country code, but it's not in the top 25 things to check. But there's a lot of things we might want to go back and check from a tuning standpoint. The top 25 were like important. These are, are aren't are not unimportant. They're also important, but they have a little lesser value. So I didn't want to just throw 66 out and that feels like it's overwhelming because it is, especially because there's three columns. That's nearly 200 things to check. But some of these you want, might want to look at. And some of them are like airtime fairness. You hear your vendor, oh, turn it on. We have the best airtime fairness. Yeah, but I found that when you do turn it on, it doesn't always work. And sometimes uh, it makes things worse. So find out in your environment with your vendors, both on your client and your access point side, does airtime fairness improve or not improve? Same with things like MU MIMO, OFDMA. There's some recommendations here to not have it. You're like, but it's the coolest, hottest thing since sliced bread and the vendors think, yeah, it, but it's not currently, especially if you don't have a high percentage of clients that can support it by turning it on you get a lot of things like sounding frames that chew up time without giving you anything else back same with things like transmit beamforming so there's a lot of these smaller less obvious issues but you still should be there going and look at them so there's an extended checklist that has all of those there's also a notes for each of them but as you see here it's like it fits on a page but it's it's like an a4 long page to, to pull those off Nothing wrong with ignoring the 66, other than you might miss something that could make your network perform better. Now, I've been bending, there's 200 things you're going to have to look at here. 
it's still complex. <laughs> we have a checklist. It didn't make less things go away. We just organize them into a place where you know where to go look. You need to know when to follow the rules. There are lots of rules. Years ago, I had a, you know, the top 10, the top 20 top rules for, for designing Wi-Fi networks. And every one of them you can break. But the, the question in your own mind should be, do I understand why this rule is in place? And I know why I'm breaking it. If you don't know why you're breaking it, then don't break it. If you hear some, like, I, I get people, sorry, I really don't like Spiceworks. <laughs> I see people post there and I, I don't go and hang out there. Some people say, hey, help me. I just recommended this. And I look and I'm like, who recommended doing this? Because it's a stupid thing to do if you understand how the protocol works. So you still have to understand how the protocol works. But the checklists are a way or a list of rules are a way where you can kind of take best practices from others and apply them. I am not saying do not break the rules. I am saying break the rules if you know why to break the rules. I've hung lots of APs on the wall like a clock, but I would not walk into a hotel and see them hung on the wall like a clock and say, oh, that's a really good design because there's reasons why it shouldn't be your first thing. But there are reasons to do that. There are some specific nerd dobs you can turn in, in different vendor environments. If you know what they are, then apply those. I'm just saying we came up with a group of checklists. Seven years ago, I said not to. Six years ago, I said not to. And then I spent the last five years trying to figure one out because it's very helpful to have things that help us along our way. The next little checklist, this is the fourth one, is you also need to do a connection checklist because even though you did the others and you analyzed everything and it works great and you used Echo House Analyzer or Optimizer and you found out you met all the things on the checklist, it's when the rubber meets the road. The client actually has to connect and send data. And the process here, it, if you're on my little bubble sheet, there's a steps to go through. But I, I made a, a different one here to say, we first start with 802.11 association, then we authenticate, and then we encrypt, and then we open the port control, and then we get upper layers, and we get IP address and DHCP and default gateway and all that information. And then we have access to the LAN, and then we get a captive portal. The captive portal is after all of the Wi-Fi things, all of the LAN things work. So when you see a captive portal, splash screen on your screen, you go, yes, Wi-Fi is working. Now you might not pass the captive portal because there's an entire letter troubleshooting of how to troubleshoot captive portals. Be able to understand that along the way, what are telltale signs that things are working? If I have an IP address on my wireless NIC, the Wi-Fi is working because how did I get it? It came to me over the wireless network. That doesn't mean the wireless network is not congested or have other issues, or I might have an MCS of zero because we had such a terrible RF environment, but it is working. One of the things I, I, I've been saying for oh, decades now is a association is to wireless what a link light is to wired. If you get a link light when you plug into an ethernet jack, there's things you know, and there's things you don't know. You don't know is DHCP working. You don't know if you're on the right VLAN, but if you get a link light, you know there's connectivity to the switch and the switch is sending it back and there's certain things that are working. When we get an association Wi-Fi, we know some things are working. We don't know everything's working, but we know what it is. And so just like in Wired, if I get a link light, I'm not going to go, oh, I need to replace the patch cord. You might need to replace the patch cord for another reason, but not because you got a link light. If you get an association, that doesn't mean you should go change your AP. And so understanding how the flow works helps along the way. So we need to test this. So here's a way to do some connection testing. You use a client device to do this, and you would like to see all the SSIDs that are supposed to be there. You'd like to associate to the target SSID you want and complete authentication at the 802.11 level. You want to get past that and get authentication at the network level if you're running some sort of encryption. You get an IP address. You get a default gateway. And then you want to be able to ping the default gateway and ping to the DNS. And I would like to 
to send a ping to an address on the other side of my gateway using an IP address. Now I asked someone about this the last week and was like, yeah, I always go to 888.888. One, because it's easy to remember. Two, it's also a DNS. But mainly I want a number that doesn't have to go through DNS to make sure that I'm working because a lot of times it is DNS. And there's a process to go through and check, is my client doing what it's supposed to be doing? So hey, Keith. we talk, yes. Um, yeah, go ahead. You, uh, you told a really great, a great story the other day about a, a really challenging Wi-Fi issue that you um, had to go over to the, I think it was a uh, private island that you had to go and you, you spent a no, lot was, of time trying to fix was, a Wi-Fi issue. It was Dubai. They sent me a private plane and ah. it, was, it was a VLAN mismatch. Had nothing oh, yeah. to do with Wi-Fi. I did enjoy the plane ride, but it was, yeah. So just because you think it's a wireless problem, be able to realize and quickly see what the problem is. I had a, an, another issue. It happened, just happened to be in Dubai. I was at a hotel and I, I was complaining because the network, in, you know, the internet was horrendously slow. And I went to the front desk and I was actually teaching class in the hotel and it was a brand new hotel. And the manager happened to be there and I went to talk about the network and he just, instantly defensive and is like, we just spend all this money on getting brand new Wi-Fi. We have fantastic Wi-Fi. And I went, you do, you have fantastic Wi-Fi. I was connected to their Wi-Fi at 868, like as fast as possible I could be connected. And he goes, what are you complaining about then? I said, well, I'm getting very slow connection. And his answer to me was, hey, but we have an E1. Now, anyone who's old enough to know E1s are faster than T1s, but they're incredibly slow in today's world. And he thought that by fixing the Wi-Fi, they fixed their internet connection. And he was complaining, we've been spent all this money and we have terrible, people are always complaining about our Wi-Fi. And I'm like, it's not your Wi-Fi, it's your backhaul. And he goes, what's the difference? And then I had to sit down and draw a little picture and I went through and he goes, oh, but the thing you want me to spend money on costs money every month. And I spent capital money for the new Wi-Fi. How come that didn't fix my little teeny internet pipe? So we do need to understand the big picture of things. So I did today, I talked about four checklists. How do I have a wireless problem? The top 25, the extended list down to 65. And you can get all of those if you go to this little QR code and, and there's a website. It also has access to all the resources. But I'd like to talk about another thing that this isn't shouldn't be the end we've we've been working i've been personally working on this for seven years or longer and we need to keep working on checklists we need to make them tune them make them work for your own network but man mac years ago put together this ladder diagram for 802.1x i think we need as a as a community to build a checklist for dot one x because dot one x is a pain but sometimes the problem, okay, not sometimes, most of the time, the problem has nothing to do with wireless. If you're capturing a .1x connection and all you have is the packet capture in the air, you will see only the stuff that's on the left side here from the client to the AP. But the problem could exist between the authenticator and the authentication server and you miss it all. And there's things like which port you're using and what's the shared secret. And then there's not even on the, on this picture they have, there's a connection between the authentication server and the database that's holding it. And those have connections as well. I think as a group, we need to come up with another checklist. How do you troubleshoot dot one X? So I'm, I'll be working on that. I hope you'll be working on it as well. I said this at Wi-Fi design day last week. And I will say it again now, knowledge is like manure. If you spread it around, it just helps things grow. If you try to hold on to it yourself, you just stink. So in that knowledge, I'd like to share from WOPC. We record all of our shows for the last 10 years, every presentation, and they're up. There's over a thousand of them available on YouTube. Just go to YouTube for wireless land professionals. I know, um, Open Reality shares all those from the Wi-Fi Design Day, and as soon as those are up, I'll repost them, and I'm sure Matt and Mac will repost those as well. Hey Keith, when is the next? When's the next WLPC? October in Prague. 
In fact, the okay, next thing that's coming up will be a call for presentations for Prague in about hmm, probably six, eight weeks from now. Before the 1st of June, we'll have the call for presentations for Prague. Oh, there's another one in the summer in Valencia if you speak Spanish. Um, do you speak Spanish, Matt? Uh, no bueno. <laughs> no bueno. It might happen. <laughs> so one last thing, and then we go to Q&A. I think we should all be nice. We should be happy. We should be grateful of where we are and just be satisfied to be you. You're good at what you are. I feel good with me. And I think we should all head that way. So I'll flip it back and let, uh, let you take over the share and go to a Q and A. Thank you very much. I mean, I can see everybody saying how amazing the uh, checklist and the presentation was, um, Keith. So thank you so much. We've got uh, quite a lot of uh, questions in the Q and A. The uh, the most kind of like upvoted one though, um, kind of came around when you were talking around the channels, and is it the question kind of around how to do a channel interference and what like, what is your kind of recommendation? Because uh, typically, like an access point vendor will have some form of like RRM or a DCA or an automatic channel plan. Uh, what is your kind of recommendation? Do you recommend using those? Uh, access point vendors rrm and ai channel planner or do you go static like what is your kind of um, recommendation of course i'm a wi-fi engineer my answer is it depends <laughs> um i have some customers that i only static even uh two three thousand access points will static now that doesn't mean i have to personally touch every single ap i let the system work and then i lock it down after a while it's the changes that cause issues. And so I will, I'll take a customer, I'll do a design, we'll do an install, we fire it up. And in the install in Echo, how I, I see that I can get no co-channel inference. It's possible using Echo's algorithm for channel planning. And it does a good job of that. But then when the, invent, the vendor installs and the vendor's RRM takes over, sometimes it doesn't do the same thing that Echo did. Okay, most of the time it doesn't. And so then after it's run for a while, I'll come back and I'll, in Echo, do a survey again, collect the data and see that, oh, we now have coach interference here and here and here. And then I go back and lock it and then fix just the ones that need to be fixed and have a great time. Now, I have to admit, I've made a lot of money doing that. And I make my money when people call me in at breaks. So I, I don't get mad at them. I come back, I redo the same thing again, and I say, you turned on RM, right? Yeah, okay, and this is your problem. Let's go fix it, we fix it. And then a new code base comes out and they turn back on RRM and it causes a problem with the network. Uh, my, my personal issue with RMs, not that they're not great, but most of them don't use the client side information enough. And it's the clients that matter. If an AP can see another AP, I don't care. And in fact, for all vendor-based RRMs, they use AP to AP to communications to figure out what's going on. So they should be using AP to client, but they don't always have the client data. So I have for many of my customers went static, but I also understand that it's a pain to go static. It costs money and I'm the only one who makes it. So a lot of my customers don't like to go static. They would rather have automatic. There you have to go and learn how to tune the RRM. If you take it right out of the box, it's probably not going to work right. But if you spend the time to tune it properly, giving it some boundaries, tell it highs and lows, um, it, it can work. So I don't know if that was the question. That was, that was, no, that was the question. And you gave a fantastic answer. And actually, I think I might be able to just visualize for people that, that last thing that you said, which was really great piece of information. So what Keith was saying, I'm going to paraphrase here, but defaults are dangerous. If you don't go in and tweak uh and set some very like variations and limits for the access point vendors and variations to the for the channels and the radios sometimes they can go pretty wild so i'm just going to give you an example here of someone that didn't go to site to actually do the survey or even did the design it was just a remote design and they just got it installed they just got the network working and they just left it alone someone called up us it could have been called me they could have called keith and said hey the wi-fi is not working we've got some issues so let me just give you an example of what can happen if you do just leave everything to defaults. And if I just zoom in a little bit, Keith, I know you're probably uh, making you die a little bit inside seeing this here, but can you see what's going on? 
uh some sometimes uh, access point ben ap's from the access point vendors they have something that's called like a flexible radio so if you know you don't need to ser serve 2.4 gigahertz clients the 2.4 radio can be turned into another 5 gigahertz radio uh so what has happened here is that this access point has actually changed its 2.4 radio to a 5 gigahertz radio and on uh, both of its 5 gigahertz radio, it's decided to use 80 megahertz wide channels. So that means that one access point here is occupying 160 megahertz of spectrum on 5 gigahertz. And when when you have an access point uh, that's using just one of its radios for 5 gigahertz, in this, this same space here, we've got an 80 megahertz wide channel uh, on the 5 gig radio. And then we've got two radios of an access point using 80 megahertz wide channels. So yeah, if you're going to do defaults just be careful you should um definitely recommend that you tune and set some limits and some parameters for when you go to do your radio resource management or dynamic channel assignment and set some boundaries to probably not allow that this kind of thing to happen and I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with me keith that it's, it's better to have two 20 megahertz wide channels not sharing the same channel rather than 140 megahertz or 240 megahertz on the same on the same channel and and i've i've seen this problem all over the world because clients prefer wider channels to narrower channels. Every client manufacturer, that's part of their algorithms. And you get bigger net numbers when you try to show, oh, what's my data rate? They're always bigger when you have wider channels. The hard part is this kind of made me throw up in my mouth a little bit. It is terrible because th that whole area, everyone is going to have trouble. Exactly. And it doesn't matter that they're 80 megahertz wide, that they're going to get to transmit more data when they transmit they'll get less chances to transmit because they have to wait for everyone in that area every single client and every single ap is on the same frequency and not to mention i didn't see if it looks like there are even obss conditions there make mm -hmm. it even worse yeah and um just to to go full circle back to keith check checklist from earlier where he asked his a uh, AP installation team or cable installation team to go through that checklist and also do you, do you remember after the checklist he gets like a picture of the access point of where it's been installed mm -hmm. uh, let me show you why that's important because I have a feeling that Keith that the installation of this access point may not have passed your checklist if you had received <laughs> uh, uh, received this. So not not really the best place for an access point, I would say. Um, but again, like having that checklist, imagine if the install team had that checklist and was sending a photo of every single one to Keith. There's no way Keith would let this. Oh, uh, oh, sorry, bit bit fast there. This access point here passed that checklist because it's why is this bad it's completely surrounded by metal and what's going to happen is as the waves come out of the access point they're going to probably get interfered with corrupted and it's going to cause a whole bunch of issues so coming back to multipath is might... good right <laughs> we get more multipath yeah yeah i mean um exactly but with with that with if, with a checklist in place for this, we probably wouldn't we we may not have had to come on site to try and fix this. I think in the picture you can see that this was like a completely brand new office. People hadn't even moved in yet, and before people had even got to the site, there was complaints just from the the guys and the girls actually, um, just you know. You can see all of that, the chairs on desks and the, there's no screens or anything. So like, no one had even moved in to start like officially using the Wi-Fi yet. Just the people, a few people trying to set up the the office environment couldn't use the Wi-Fi. And there was a whole bunch of reasons, but physical installation, con default configuration all played a huge, huge part here. So um, I thought can, that was just... In, in those pictures, you can see they had other things placed properly, just yeah. not the APs. So it wasn't yeah. that they didn't know that they could place them on that drop ceiling. They just didn't. Exactly. So they just wasn't following a uh, proper documentation or a checklist that would have resolved all of those all of those issues. I see you've come back there, Dale. Did you have any um, questions? Yeah, a few a few upvoted questions. So one of those is, what are your recommendations around using DFS channels indoors? Always. Oh, one. Don't be afraid of DFS. There's nothing in DFS you should be afraid of. And don't think I'm by an airport, thus DFS. I have sites that are smack on the end of a runway with DFS channels and we have no issues at all. So it's not that you shouldn't use DFS. You should always use DFS. It's like channels. There's a rule. Use the widest channel you can until you can't. As soon as you get co-channel interference, stop and go to a, a smaller channel width. 
Same with DFS. Use them all. How do I know when I should stop? When I look in the logs and I have DFS events over and over and over again on channel 56, you might want to pull 56 out of your channel plan. But don't just be afraid of DFS because they're DFS. Use them until you can't. That means you should be watching your network, looking at your logs and making sure that you're not getting DFS events. You could use a tool like a Wi-Fi metrics where you could trigger a DFS event and then watch how your vendor events happen. Do they count down five, four, three, two, one change? Do they send channel switch announcements? Are they mean and they don't send channel switch announcements? They just move. Uh, when they move, do they always move to the same place? There's lots of issues with DFS events, but if you're not getting events, go ahead and use the channels. Thanks Keith. And then another one that was upvoted is, um, how do you, how would you suggest addressing situations where your own Wi-Fi network is optimized, but you have neighbors around that might have poor configurations and it's impacting your environment, particularly in terms of co-channel interference, co-channel contention. What are ways to address that? Well, bake a cake, some cookies, mm -hmm. take it to your neighbor. Uh, I've worked for many customers as a consultant, helping them out. And I have, rarely it's happened, but rarely will I go to a neighbor and explain the situation and have the neighbor go, what? You'll help me fix my network for free. And my customer pays me to fix their neighbor's networks because then it makes their networks better. If you don't fix the neighbors, you're never going to get better. So you can work together. The hard part usually is getting them to convince them to stop using 160s or 80s because they're causing harm, not just to themselves, but they're causing harm to four of your twenties along the way. Nice. But be nice, be nice, talk to them. They usually, yeah. they usually like, they probably, most of the ones, especially in a high density environment, they don't have anyone who knows what they're doing. They just installed and let the default work. Sometimes you run across someone that has some corporate overlord that says you have to do it this way. And then you have to contact the corporate overlord. And as soon as you get someone who you can talk to uh, intelligently, the problem usually solves itself. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we are 15 minutes over the uh, top of the hour and I know a lot of people have got a drop. So um, uh, I, I want to say thank you so much, Keith, for an amazing presentation, but not only that, for sharing also uh, the checklist. So if you if you missed it, you can head over to the, the WLPC or WLAN Pro's website to, to get th those checklists. And like Keith said, we need to share that information around and uh, you'd be able to put all of that information from there too. Um, so I just want to oh, say a huge thank you. Can I give a just a little hint? If you don't agree with what's on the checklist, let me know. They're they're dynamic. Let's change them to make them work as good as possible. So don't think of this as it's set in stone. It's uh, it's a project we're going to work on together. Exactly. Um. So I just want to say a big thank you to you, Keith, and anyone um that wants to sign up early for our, our next webinar. Uh, it was Andrew McHale who was also at Wi-Fi Design Day. He actually be joining us for a webinar. He um had a lot of information and data about uh, six gigahertz and clients. If you if you heard of Andrew McHale before, he's kind of known for for voice over Wi-Fi, and uh, he is going to be sharing some fantastic tips for how you can design and also make sure your networks are optimized for Wi-Fi networks. And he's done a whole bunch of testing regarding six gigahertz and how phones and devices are behaving against different types of configuration and parameters. So if you want to see that to make sure you can have voice working properly over your Wi-Fi network, go ahead and scan that QR code or sign up on the uh, link below for the webinar and we'll be able to see you on the next one. So a huge thank you to you, Keith, for taking the time to join us, obviously, last week at Wi-Fi Design Day and again today on the Echo webinar. Dale, Echo team and everyone still on over such a, a, a fantastic webinar today. So thank you very much, everybody, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.